All right, immunologic emergencies as they relate to EMS. This chapter is going to focus mostly on allergic reactions and hypersensitivities. Um, the immune system and the way we fight bacterial and viral infections will be covered in the infectious disease chapter in our next unit, but not this unit. So. Um, the most common or most dangerous uh, condition that we would have to be concerned about in this chapter is going to be the anaphylactic reactions. But we'll also look at allergic reactions and anaphylactoid re reactions and some autoimmune disorders like uh, lupus and things like that. So. Um, these are, um, you know, kind of gives you the range of what we're going to be looking at or, or what we could face with our patients in these conditions. So hypersensitivity, allergic, anaphylactic, uh, biphasic, anaphylactoid, collagen vascular disease, that's the uh, like lupus and things along those lines, and then transplant disorders or transplant related stuff. So here we can see erythema, and um, which is that redness, hives, um, swelling all over the body. We have fairly significant reaction there. All right, so this is our normal immune response. This is how we normally should function. We have the two forms of immunity. We have cellular and humoral. Remember, humoral is regulated by, ana or uses antibodies within the blood blood and is regulated by plasma cells, whereas uh, cellular immunity, your primary cell is gonna be T cells. The uh, T cells are actually attacking the organism or the infected body cell. <laughs> so an allergen for the purpose of this chapter anything that produces an allergic symptom. This is generally going to be something that is foreign to the body, but yet might still be human tissue, could just be a you know like an organ transplant or something, but basically something that's gonna create a reaction. The antibody is the protein that our body produces in the plasma cells to bind to specific antigens. So allergens and antigens, if you remember from our pathophys chapter, um, our patho and ANP unit, we talked about antigens and antibodies. For this chapter, the antigen is the allergen. Those, those are synonymous terms. Proteins are globulin or immunoglobulins within the plasma. IgE is the one that we're going to talk and concern most about today. Even though IgE is actually a pretty low frequency uh, type of antigen or um, antibody, you know, it doesn't make up the majority of our percentage or anything. It is the predominant hist uh, antibody released during an anaphylactic reaction. And so when we come in contact with things like uh, it gives the antibiotics such as penicillin, peanuts, eggs, or other common allergens. IgE hist um, antibodies are the ones that generally are, well, are the ones uh, creating those responses. So, all right. Um, local versus systemic. I think that term should go without explanation. Everybody good on that? Any questions? What makes one or the other? So that is when we're looking at immune responses, the first one we want to talk about is hypersensitivity. This is simply having a less than normal or inappropriate response. Uh, allergic reactions could be, um, could you know, they go under the category of hypersensitivity, but most of the time when we say hypersensitivity, we're going to say, oh, well, this substance created an effect in you that isn't common to all people, uh, but might happen. So, for example, a person may take um, aspirin and it causes them to have an upset stomach or causes them GI distress. Well, they're not allergic to aspirin, they're just more sensitive to it than another person might be. Um, but it doesn't necessarily have to be 
significant or harmful to the uh, to the human body. It's just the body thinks it's going to be harmful. So here's our routes of entry. These are the exact same as if with medication and with uh, toxicology and hazmat, any of these forms, how the allergen gets into our body. All right. Um, I think our most common con example of allergies would be seasonal allergies, um, allergic rhinitis. This would be, you know, the runny nose, hay fever, uh, pollen, um, air quality conditions, whatever, you know, whatever triggers yours, um, change of weather. Uh, that's why we see it this time of year and in the spring, because we're going from hot to cold and then from cold to hot. Um, Atopic dermatitis, this might be uh, the redness or itching that comes from latex sensitivity or from adhesive tape or something on the skin. Asthma, while an inflammatory disease in a longer term process can be aggravated by local allergens or temporary allergens like cat dander or something along those lines. It is important to try to figure out what is new, what what did this patient, what were they exposed to that they have not been exposed to before or have had very limited exposure. One thing we'll point out as we go, as we move through this is you in fact, tip, you typically will have to be exposed to a substance more than once before you can have a reaction to it. You don't normally react the first time, though it is possible. Um, what do you think the route of exposure, what, what impact will the route of exposure have on the patient's reaction? You know, if we go back here to routes, injection, absorption, inhalation, ingestion. So talk to me about this. What impact will this have? Yeah, oftentimes the onset, the speed of onset will be affected. Something that was injected or inhaled will tend to create the reaction faster than something that was ingested or absorbed. But uh, somebody who maybe has a allergy to a certain food, like a severe allergy to that food, maybe peanuts or whatever, if they get it in their mouth, well, the allergen is now being absorbed through their mucous membranes of their mouth. So therefore, it will start to reaction pretty quickly. Um, it'll also be a matter of how much is required. Something that was injected or inhaled may not require the same quantity as something that was absorbed, you know, just uh, on the skin. You know, a patient might be allergic to peanuts if they eat peanuts, but won't be affected if the peanut touches their skin because they can clean it off and there's just uh, not, there's enough barrier there to protect them. All right, so what's the first response to immune reactions? This is when the macrophages in, uh, identify and attack that substance. And it's a, you know, they start their phagocytosis and um, they will, the macrophages will then take portions of that allergen back to the lymph nodes and it will try to compare it to previous exposures. And this might be like, oh yeah, we've been exposed to this substance before, mount this response. Antibodies are already there and it's a very quick reaction, which is why anaphylaxis can gen generally happens after a subsequent exposure. If this is a new substance, then it presents that um, substance to the other B cells within the lymph node, which then produce plasma cells that are specific to that uh, antibody, excuse me, that antigen. So now the antibodies produced by those plasma cells will be very specific. So this might be the result of a in, um, injection by wasp venom or a food or something like that. And so it's going to take a longer response. Um, this is, you know, looking at antibodies. Now, there are cross sensitivities. For example, certain substances might create a similar reaction as another because they have receptor sites on them that are very close. And so the same antibody might work for it and that 
And so the macrophage that initially responds in initial phagocytosis might trigger the, res uh, the release of those similar antibodies and that creates the same response. Antibody releases generally don't create a lot of problems for the patient though. These are not normally gonna show a whole lot of symptoms. The problem is your mast cells and your basophils. So these granular cells, while they produce and store a lot of antibodies and, um, sits, and they stay there, these, have, these are where your big problem is gonna come from. When, when activated, basocells and mast cells are going to release things like leukotrienes and histamines. These are chemical mediators. These are going to make it easier for the immune cells to fight this invasion, and it will also make it easier for antibodies to be moved into the area. Uh, anytime something foreign has been recognized as in the tissue, the mast cells and basophils um, Mast cells are the ones that stay located, you know, stay in connective tissue like in your uh, GI tract or all under your skin, whereas basophils are floating through the bloodstream. They're going to release the histamines, they're going to release the leukotrienes, and that's going to cause local vasodilation, attract more blood cells to the area, and that'll bring in the plasma cells that have the antibodies to help attract the antibodies to the area. So you see, it's not the antibodies that are creating the reaction, it's the histamines and the leukotrienes that are causing the vasodilation, which is great, it's useful, we need it, we have to increase that blood flow, we need to bring in more white blood cells, we need to bring in antibodies but when this localized reaction becomes systemic that's when we have the issues so here you can see these mast cells or basophils this could be either one of those are the same essentially they're covered in antibodies these are kind of like storing antibodies and whenever a new substance that happens to match to one of those antibodies shows up it starts releasing its histamines and what are histamines going to do well first they cause bronchospasms and vasoconstriction um the um no not vasoconstriction vasodilation oh vasoconstriction in the pulmonary vessels that's right i'm sorry in the pulmonary vessels there's going to be some vasoconstriction going on which is opposite or different from systemically so the bronchospasm is going to tighten the lungs up decrease air movement kind of like imagine the body thinks that the invasion is coming through the lungs and it's closing the gate and so it tightens the lungs up so that it stops absorbing this infectious material um, decreased cardiac output weakens the heart decreased coronary blood flow this is to stop circulating the blood slow circulation down to try to stop the spread of this antigen <sighs> Blood vessels throughout the body are going to dilate. This is so that they stretch out, slow the flow, and allow the monocytes, macrophages, uh, to move out of the bloodstream into the tissue and a local uh, or, uh, identify and uh, remove the invading antigen. Well, again, that's what causes the swelling. You get stung by a bee or whatever. You get a swollen lump on your arm. That's because of the histamines. But when this happens across the entire body, when histamines start releasing in a chain reaction through you know, the arms and legs and everywhere, well, now you're increasing your circulating, your blood vessel size. And so you've reduced your blood volume relative to the size. The size of the vessels got bigger, the volume stayed the same, and now it appears to have less blood volume than before. This is where your anaphylactic shock's gonna come from. This is where you have a relative hypovolemia. And then the urticaria, edema and puritis, this is those the bumps uh, and redness and itching in the skin that we'll see. Um, as a result of the infection, not the infection, but the um, exposure to the allergen. So somebody is reacting to a allergen, the bee sting, food, whatever it happens to be. First and foremost, make certain that whatever they were exposed to is not going to cause a problem for you. Because the last thing you want to do is walk into a bee sting, be allergic to bees, and get stung yourself. So make certain that you've cleared the scene and that you're safe there.
Assessment after that becomes the same as all other assessments. But the ABCs are very important because these are conditions that directly interfere or affect our ABCs and mental status, and so we want to act quickly to intervene. So types of allergic reactions, we can categorize it this way, um, mild, local, moderate, mild signs across the body. So this might be the person who has red hives and itching on you know, arms, legs, and torso. They're, you know, they're itching everywhere. They got exposed on one area of their arm and now everywhere's got hives. That would be a moderate reaction. Hives is not a big concern, doesn't cause trouble breathing or anything like that. So we don't, so it's a mild. Anaphylaxis would be a severe concern. This is where you're starting to have difficulty breathing, shortness of breath, strider, swollen tongue, wheezes, whatever that happens, what other other symptoms they present with. This is severe and not necessarily shock. Shock can come after that, anaphylactic shock, that is. All right. Um, yeah. You can read. Noisy upper airway. What we're looking talking about here, strider and hoarseness. This is because the patient is have um, swelling in their trachea and larynx area, making it harder for them to breathe, making it harder for them to make noise. The swollen vocal cords make their uh, voice sound hoarse. This um, might that swelling may be present as a tightness, and that's so that's what they're complaining of. It's a tightness in their throat. Um, if it's severe and you can hear it without a stethoscope, we are, we are already behind the eight ball. Um, hopefully you won't notice it until you start doing your auscultation of lung sounds and things like that, and you'll be earlier in the game. Yeah, earlier and the sooner that you're finding abnormal lung sounds, the more severe this reaction is gonna be, the quicker the, thing, the reaction is progressing. Um, of course, we talked in asthma and COPD about how dangerous a absent lung sound is or the lack thereof of any air movement in the lungs. That's a very big concern. And um, so watch out for that. Don't don't have a pa don't assume the patient has OK lung sounds. You just can't hear them when they're struggling to breathe. They're showing signs of hypoxia. They have tachypnea going on. You listen to the lungs and you're like, I don't hear anything. Well, yeah, you probably you might not like that might actually just be silent lung. They they're that tight. You can't hear it. So don't just say, oh, well, they're lung. I don't hear anything. So their lungs are probably OK. Well, if they look short of breath, they look crappy. They've been exposed and you're not hearing anything, that's a bad sign. All right, so mentioned these skin conditions earlier. You Most of your shock symptoms come later in your uh, process because it's the leukotriene histamine reaction that has to cause that dilation throughout the whole body. While it quickly reacts in the throat, and that's you know going to be your airway concerns, for the circulatory concern, it's going to take a little bit longer for it to spread to all those areas. And the treatment for that portion of the problem is the same as everything else, except you add fluids. So a anaphylactic patient doesn't need fluids per se, but an anaphylactic shock patient would. Um, how do you know that they are in shock versus just simply having an anaphylactic reaction? Um, you know, look at the mono, uh, heart rate, look at the um, blood pressure. If the patient has an elevated heart rate, that actually is a good sign. Uh, it's the patients who have low blood pressure and low heart rate because the histamines are weakening the heart, slowing the heart down, reducing that blood pressure and rate. That's where you have a real big concern. But again, the treatment you're going to use is going to fix that. That's what we're aiming for here. Most of our treatment is focused on fixing those symptoms and not actually fixing the immune, the anaphylactic, or excuse me, the allergic reaction that was taking place. So, if your patient is showing mild or even sometimes moderate symptoms, staying on scene is probably just fine. A mild symptom, there's really no reason to transport. There's no concern here. However, if you have a patient um, showing a... Uh, 
anaphylaxis, you know, a severe reaction of some sort, do not waste time on scene. Get headed to the hospital. Do your stuff in route. Don't waste time. If you're way out in the boonies and you have a long drive to the hospital, consider a helicopter for a couple of reasons. Uh, more ALS hands on scene. If the patient needs an airway, if they start crashing, most helicopters have the ability to RSI. That is a huge benefit here because if the swelling gets to the point that you need to take their airway, it's better to do it electively before the vocal cords have swollen shut than to wait until they've already swollen shut. Does that follow? You don't want to be forcing your ET tube or forcing yourself to have to do a crike because they didn't respond to your anaphylactic treatments earlier. So, and then of course the helicopter would have a more rapid transport time when you're in a remote area. You know, what allergies do they have? Have they reacted before? Have they been exposed to the substance before? What substance do they think they're reacting to? And it is very possible the substance they are reacting to is not the one they thought. That they assumed, oh, this must have had peanuts in it, therefore I'm um, that's why I'm having this reaction. Well, find out. Does that substance, that you know, food product or whatever in question actually have peanuts in it? Um, it may not. And they may have been exposed to in some other way that they aren't aware of. Most people who are seriously allergic to food are very aware of it and very careful. And so it's only when they're given food they're not familiar with or worse, unexpected, that they'll have a problem. Or there's been times where I've run the call where they um, were given food they thought it was... Um, item A, but it turned out to be item B, and now they don't know what's in it. And so they're worried because, well, if it is bad, it's already too late kind of a thing in their mind. So what do they take? What intervent um, medications do they have? What has been done for them before? Kind of like with the asthma patient. Have you ever been intubated? Has your, have you ever been put on a breathing machine? Have you ever been kept overnight in the hospital as a result? Do they have an EpiPen? Um, if we can avoid it, Let's avoid using their EpiPen. Uh, hopefully, if they have one and need it, they would have taken it prior to our arrival on scene. But if not, we really don't want them. Um, you know, we don't want them to have to replace their EpiPen and buy a new EpiPen when um, we have medication that's far less expensive. So here's some of our treatments that we might need to do. Epi, uh, sub-Q, or um, IM, it can be done either way, but the Epi pin is generally sub-Q. And then uh, Benadryl, we'll have that. Beta agonist inhaler, what is this referring to? What are we talking about here? What? Yep, albuterol. That's what they're going for. So, um, and then aerosol epinephrine, that could be racemic epi. I don't see that as much um, in protocols. It is possible. It's just not as common. There are other options here. One of the things is not mentioned is the use of an epi drip. And we'll talk about that here in a little bit. All right. So, um, your airway and breathing, that's all going to be primary. That's not really secondary, although you're going to follow up on it and maybe evaluate it in more depth than you would have on your primary. All right. Um, yeah, always use cardiac monitor. Um, nothing wrong with giving them some oxygen. Uh, Pay really close attention to your patients. Do frequent reassessments, lungs, skin, blood pressure, skin color condition, temp, that kind of thing. Constantly reevaluate that stuff during the transport if you have an anaphylactic. I mean, even mild patient, mild reactions need to have frequent reassessments. It doesn't have to be as continuous it is, as it is with anaphylaxis because Sometimes your mild to moderate allergic reaction on scene is actually going to become a severe reaction. Just uh, it's just delayed. Mm. All right. So you perform it. Let's say you have a patient. They're presenting poorly. You identify a specific intervention that you need to do. You perform that intervention. 
You've performed the intervention. What do you do next? Any intervention. No, you know, don't don't overthink it. You've performed an intervention. What do you do now? Reassess. You've performed an intervention. Did the intervention cause the change you wanted? You reassess them and look for what happened. Well, let's say you reassess and there was some improvement. Maybe not a lot, but there was some. Then you reassess the next time and now they're bad again. What do you do? You could go to the next intervention on the list or you could, if necessary, repeat the first intervention. The first intervention worked. You had improvement. You know it did its job, so if necessary, repeat it. One of the issues that I see with students doing uh, learning this is for assuming that one dose of epi was all that was needed. Or, well, we gave the epi, and but they're still having a reaction, so maybe we need to give something else. Well, maybe you need to give something else, or maybe you need to give more epi, because you gave the epi, they got a little bit better, but then they got worse again, give them more epi. And we'll see how that plays out here. So glad they can remind us that we need to call a patient report. <sighs> All right, so if it's anaphylaxis, treat early. But people who have severe allergic reactions or have had or are at risk of severe allergic reactions freak out at the idea of having a reaction. So make certain prior to administering any medication that the symptoms that you're seeing and dealing with are in fact allergic reaction symptoms. Do they have wheezing? Do they have strider? Do they have decreased air movement? Do they have redness, rash, hives, swelling, and things like that? Or do they think they were exposed and are now having a panic attack? Because panic attack is going to do what? Give you the idea of trouble breathing make you feel like you're having a hard time breathing, make the patient breathe fast, increase their heart rate, cause them to get upset and anxious. Similarly to the an uh, anaphylactic reaction, they're going to get upset, they're going to be anxious, they're going to be unstable. These are, it's really important to rule that out. Calm the patient, be reassuring to them, because if they're only reacting as far as like an, an anxiety attack to the potential of an exposure, well, that doesn't require epi and albuterol and diphenhydramine. So you want to be able to do a good, thorough assessment prior to starting treatment. When the patient presents with difficulty breathing, with airway issues, then absolutely hit them with that epi early on. So if I'm going to give my patient epi, what type of epi am I going to give? Savannah. I think Savannah is going to claim their mic doesn't work. They unmuted it, but I can't hear them. Yep, looks like they're having mic issues. All right, so um, somebody else, Mississippi. What type of epi are we going to use for an anaphylactic reaction? Well, it could be, but that's not that's not typically our first line. Yes, 1 to 1,000, either IM or sub-Q. It can be either way. But what's the dose, Mississippi? If we're going uh, to give epi 1 to 1,000 for our anaphylactic patient, uh, we can use IM or sub-Q. What's that dose we're going to give them? And 
Brad, you're not wrong. You can actually give one to ten thousand, but I want you to find come up with the dose on that though, and why the kind of the why for it. Yeah, it's one one milligram is in the vial for both of one to ten and one to one. I didn't hear that. No, 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 no. That would no, that would hurt him. So I see Katie's over there phoning a friend, calling her partner. Hey, what's uh, what's the dose? Um. So for Epi one to one thousand, um. I am sub Q, your dose is going to be 0 0.3 to 0 0.5 milligrams. So epi 1 to 1,000, 0 0.3 to 0 0.5 milligrams. Epi 1 to 10,000 can be given IV. You would give it IV if the patient already has an IV established. An example would be a patient was going for a CT with contrast IV dye. Well, they're having a, um, a reaction to the IV dye or they're having an, a reaction to an IV antibiotic. You already have an IV established. I, your textbook is going to say that your dose of epi 1 to 10,000 would be 0 0.1 milligram. So this is a very small amount of epi compared to your sub QIM because you're trying to give it slower. And if you go and give the full one milligram, you're going to have a massive reaction take place some or response i shouldn't say reaction a lot of protocols are not going to recommend the use of iv epi uh, for anaphylaxis but it can be done a more appropriate method of iv epi is going to be using an epi infusion like an epi drip and setting up a an infusion that way so if your patient is showing signs of anaphylaxis, there's strider, there's hoarseness, there's respiratory distress, maybe wheezes or whatever, hit them with that IM sub Q epi early, 0 0.3 to 0 0.5 milligrams of one to 1,000. Remember one to 1,000 is more concentrated. So we use it IV and, or excuse me, IM and sub Q. One to 10,000 is more dilute. Therefore we use it IV. Now, our whole goal here is to avoid ventilatory support, but ventilatory support may become necessary in the long run. <clears throat> so keep that in mind. Have your BVM ready. Have your ET tube ready. Like I mentioned a minute ago with our patient it, who it was um, where we called the helicopter, be prepared to intubate before their uh, laryngeal edema causes a complete uh, closure of the airway because you don't want to have to tear up the vocal cords trying to do your RSI. After you've done that epi, then you're going to be looking at your other drugs. We're going to do epi Y. What's the epi going to do? Yeah, vaso, it uh, bronchodilates and vasoconstricts peripherally. So those are the two most concerning side effects of histamine releases is the bronchodilate constriction and the vasodilation. So it's going to reverse those. Is it stopping the um, allergic reaction? No, it's not blocking the histamines. It's not preventing histamine release. It's only counteracting those side effects. If the patient has never had a reaction before and is uncertain of the substance, even if it's a fairly mild reaction, it's always recommended they get evaluated. If, my, if it is mild, they probably don't need to be evaluated at the ER. They could probably follow up with their primary care. But um, otherwise, um, first time reactions should be evaluated. All right, so like I said earlier, you get exposed to a substance, you create antibodies, your mast cells and basophils are typed against it, and then the next time you get exposed to that substance, the basophils or the mast cells, which whichever one is activated, will create a chain reaction, 
releasing histamines throughout the body and you have a major response. This is anaphylaxis. Um, already explained how that works, so moving on from that. Um, a good way to approach anaphylaxis, try, how do you know, is this anaphylaxis or is this an allergic reaction? Is two or more systems involved, okay? If I eat a food I'm allergic to and I start vomiting, well, I ate it, I vomited it. That's one system. If I touch a substance I'm sensitive to and it causes a rash or hives, that's one system. If I breathe something in, cat dander, pollen, and I start having a reaction, that's an allergic reaction. I get, you know, stuffy nose, trouble breathing. That's not anaphylaxis. But if I eat food, have GI discomfort and trouble breathing, that's two different body systems. Now we're looking at anaphylaxis. So that's your simple differentiation. Anaphylaxis is two or more body systems being involved. Here's an example of hives on patient's back. And all right, so leukotrienes, these are longer acting chemicals. These are slower acting. As you can see, they work in all three of the you know, vasculature, heart, and lungs. They work very similarly to histamines. They just work slower. So, oh, but when there's a massive leukotriene release, it can be more severe. The interesting thing is, in general, it, the longer it's been since exposure, the less likely the patient is to have a significant reaction. But leukotriene reactions could be several hours after exposure and still be very severe. So, um, and that's a hard one to identify. And it's a good reason why just because the person had an exposure, even though they're not showing symptoms, they may want to follow up, uh, not necessarily via EMS, but they may want to follow up. So here's some of your symptoms of anaphylaxis. I think we can figure that out. You can see how it creates that ner um, neurogenic hypovolemic hypovolemic and cardiogenic shock. That's why we call it distributive shock. It's anaphylactic shock. It's a form of distributive because it mimics these other forms of shock. You have vasodilation, which is what neurogenic shock causes. You have decreased cardiac output, which is cardiogenic shock. And you have hypovolemia relative as a result of the vasodilation. But because of the histamine not only dilates the vessels it creates permeability. It causes plasma to leak out of the vessels into the tissue because that's how it would work locally. It's doing that systemically. You actually reduce your circulating blood volume as well. All right. Um, Syncope. So these are some of your assessment findings that you want to look for. These are the things you want to rule out. Syncope, flush, red man syndrome. Um, these can all look like anaphylaxis, but they are not necessarily anaphylaxis. Transfusion related. Um, this is a person who's having a reaction to blood transfusion. Um, MSG. Uh, monosodium glutinamate. This is a very rare condition, MSG poisoning. I can see that very much. Um, red man syndrome comes from certain antibiotics. Uh, asthma, you want to kind of make sure we're not dealing with one of those. ACE inhibitor angioedema, that's like the swelling of the tongue from lisinopril or drugs like lisinopril. That's probably your most likely mimic of anaphylaxis. They're not going to have wheezing. They're not going to have laryngeal edema. They're not going to have trouble breathing and um, vasodilation. So there's just their tongue. And there won't be an exposure to anything new. I actually had a patient the other night who was not on lisinopril um, and not on an ACE inhibitor to my knowledge, or from what I could tell, she had angioedema. She was swelling on her tongue on only one half. Only one side of the tongue was swelling. All right, so you have a patient with 
anaphylaxis. They're showing signs of allergic reaction. What's the first thing you wanted to do? What have I already said? Talk to me. Epi. Epi is our first line treatment. Why? Because our first treatment of epi can be given IM or sub Q. So therefore you can get that in their system really, really fast um, and then move on and worry about other things. Diphenhydramine can be given IM, but it's more effective, it's quicker if we can give it IV. So my approach is, oh, you're having anaphylaxis. Wham, hit you with the epi, slap some albuterol on you because that's going to help bronchodilate and then start an IV or be doing the epi and the albuterol while somebody else is starting an IV. Once the IV is established, I can throw the Benadryl in there. What's the dose of Benadryl going to be? Yeah, 50. The, the dose range is 25 to 50, but we're dealing with anaphylaxis. We're going to go with the full 50. So I'm going to throw the albuterol on there, start the Benadryl, and I may, uh, depending on the patient's history, consider a steroid. Steroids are not necessarily the best treatment, so they're a much later down the road treatment. They can be used. I've seen them used many times for anaphylaxis. Because they are an anti-inflammatory, they're going to work against the histamines and all that to help um, stop that press uh, process. But the epi and the Benadryl should be working pretty quickly. Obviously, if possible or necessary, remove the thing causing the reaction. Uh, if there's a substance on their body or something, or if, um, you know, scrape the um, stinger off or whatever. But Yeah, generally that should go without saying. What do you think is a, a medication a patient might be taking that will significantly hamper our treatment of anaphylaxis? What medication might make it harder for our epi and Benadryl to our epi to work? I didn't hear that. So it is beta blockers. Beta blockers will block the effect of the albuterol and the epinephrine. It does, they don't actually have an effect on the Benadryl because that's a histamine, but um, a histamine blocker. But beta blockers can affect the um, function of epi and albuterol even so that might be a reason why we're giving the albuterol and it's or and epi and it's not making a difference what are we going to do in that standpoint in that case to be honest you're going to keep giving the the epi and the albuterol the o intention is to flood the system with more beta agonists so that you overpower the beta blockers but there might be call for uh, something like calcium to circumvent the effects of the beta blocker, similar to how you would treat a beta blocker overdose. Can you give an EpiPen through the clothing? Yes. If you're an EMS provider, there is no reason for you to use the EpiPen. Draw up your meds. You're a paramedic. Draw your Epi up. Give it to them that way. You don't need to use their EpiPen. What is the max dose? That's in one dose. There is none. Yeah, if the patient is having an allergic reaction, you, uh, you know, an anaphylactic reaction, and you're having a hard time getting them to respond, I'm, I, w I would go as far as starting an epi drip and, and do a continuous infusion of epi. Mm-hmm, yeah. 
Yeah, I had a uh, I had a guy. He was in his sixties mowing the yard or doing yard work and got into a ground wasp nest and stung bad. And he stopped breathing on us in the truck. We were giving multiple doses of epi, albuterol, CPAP, him. we Benadryl, Solumedrol. We did everything. When we got to the hospital, the doctors were doing ranitidine, you know, the um, anti-acid uh, GERD meds. They were um, and considering the calcium and such. It, 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 was in a, it was in a pretty bad shape. We were hanging fluids the whole nine yards. And that's a helpless feeling because you're sitting there like, I'm doing everything I'm supposed to do. Why is it not working? So fluids, yes. Do an IO if you need to. You're trying, you need to get access quick. Um, now this is where you're talking about, where it says vasopressor, well, this could be epi. Epi would be the vasopressor of choice here over dopamine or norepi. Uh, you know, run it at 10 micrograms. The dose range is up to 30. Stay within protocol, but you know, if you're finding epi helps, but then they go back to it and like it wore off and then helps, well then that's where your epi drip can make a big difference to vasoconstrict and bronchodilate. All right. Um, Oxygen, epi, antihistamines, the anti-inflammatory immunosuppressants, those would be your steroids like solumedrol or decadron. You're going to just do your standard dose like you would with COPD or asthma. And then um, if you're only doing, what this is saying, administer histamine only, meaning giving only a histamine, excuse me, antihistamine would be your mild reaction or after epi has been given. Don't give Benadryl as your first line treatment for anaphylaxis and um, yeah, yeah. But you may use just Benadryl if it's a mild reaction. These people are going to be very upset. They're going to be very anxious, very concerned, very scared. So trying to support that, um, reassure them, comfort them can be helpful because their emotional distress will only compound the issue that you're trying to deal with. All right, that kind of ends anaphylaxis. We're going to move on to another section. I'll let you stretch your legs and wake up before we do. Chapter. So autoimmune disorders and collagen um, that, uh, collagen vascular disease. So what is autoimmune? Well, the definition here. Auto meaning self or um, so a self reaction, a, re a reaction to yourself. And then the collagen vascular, this is your body. It's a form of autoimmune specifically to uh, collagen tissues and um, so connective tissues and such like that. Um, <laughs> Here's a lot of examples of autoimmune conditions. Addison's, cardiomyopathy, celiacs, hepatitis, Crohn's, demyelinated neuropathies. That could include multiple sclerosis. Endometriosis, glomular nephritis, Graves, Guillain-Barre, hemolytic anemia, Lyme's. Now remember, Lyme's is autoimmune, but it's actually an acquired autoimmune. So it comes from what? Ticks. Lyme's disease is ten generally con con carried by ticks, and then it causes your body to react to itself. Um, it can cause migraines, trouble breathing, anemic, uh, irregular um, periods, and things like that. Other tick-borne illnesses can result in strange and unique infections and reactions, not infections, but uh, allergic reactions, like suddenly being allergic to meat or different foods that you were never allergic to before can all come as a result of tick bites. So Meniere's, what's Meniere's? We went over that last week.
What's Menares? <laughs> no, a good one. So, Meniere's disease is an infection of the inner ear and inflammation of the nerves in the inner ear that causes things like vertigo, dizziness, nausea, stuff like that. So, here's a whole list of autoimmune. Um, I would definitely say those are important to recognize because if you can recognize these diseases as autoimmune, when a question comes up relating to those or pointing to those, it helps you get an idea of what's going on. You know, most autoimmune disorders are treated in a similar way. You're trying to suppress immune response, things like that. So if you can recognize this as autoimmune, then you ought to know where uh, to go with the treatment. <laughs> All right, lupus, systemic lupus erythematosus. This is one of the most common autoimmune uh, CV, CVDs that we're going to see. This is a condition where your body will attack multiple systems throughout your uh, multiple organ systems. And these could result in life threats. Not always. Uh, it's chronic. People live quite a while with it. It's manageable. To my knowledge, it is not curable. It is merely a matter of managing the symptoms with the immunosuppression and keeping your immune system from attacking your body. Same with like, well, this is the collagen vascular scleroderma, um, but the, um, what's the word I'm looking for? I'll come, it'll come back to me. Anyway. Um, so scleroderma is part of lupus. This is where the tissue is hardened. Your skin becomes uh, hardened, but it cannot. It may not just be your skin or your muscle. It could include, as you see here, heart muscle is becoming hardened. Well, if your heart muscle gets thick and um, tightens up, well, now you're not going to have good contractility. Same with if your lung tissues get hard or tighten up and become th uh, thick, you're not going to have good gas exchange or air movement. So um, if the patient is dealing with that type of a situation where they're under, where their um, autoimmune disorder is affecting their lungs or their heart, well, if it's their heart, it's gonna be really hard for us to support that. But if it's their lungs, we may need to do um, supplemental oxygen, do uh, assist ventilations and things like that. All right, so organ transplant disorders. Why do people react to an organ transplant? Somebody from somewhere. Yeah, that was real direct. Um, talk to me about organ transplants. Why do people react to them? why it if they're a person and you just gave them some another person's liver it's not like you gave them a cow liver why is why is their immune system reacting yeah it sees it as different so our organs our cells have glycoproteins on them that are basically like uh signposts or signal markers or whatever they say made in bryce reckner on, and so all of the immune cells recognize my liver as my liver. If I was to have a liver transplant, it would say me and John Doe. And my immune cells would be like, yeah, you're not from around here. We don't like you. Get out. And would proceed to kill it. So to respond to that, when patients undergo organ transplant, they have to be put on immunosuppressives. This is newer immune suppressor medications target just the cells that attack uh, organ transfer plants but also those same cells will are you the body uses them to attack cancer so immunosuppression from organ transplants put a patient at an increased risk of cancer because they don't have their normal defense against the cancer 
it doesn't necessarily mean they will be at a greater risk of catching a bacterial infection or a flu virus. Some of the older immune transplant or organ transplant or reject anti-rejection meds is what they're called. Some of those older meds, they did put you at a higher risk of other forms of infection. They're trying to be more specific now, but even then there's still an increased risk. Um, there's an interesting new idea called a chimeric immune system, and it's when you get an organ transplant, you get a bone marrow transplant from the same person that had uh, that you got the organ from, so that you get some of their immune cells too, and that will start to uh, make it so that your your body isn't going to reject the new organ as easily. Uh, there may still have to be some more immune suppression, but it helps to reduce that likelihood. So, what organs are we going to see transplanted? What are the common organ transplants? Somebody from Conyers, start us out. Do what? Kidney? Yep, kidney's a common one. What else? Liver? Heart? Lungs, corneas, um, we don't normally, not normally spleen or pancreas. I've, I'm sure the pancreas can be, but I've never specifically heard of it. Um, but so those are some examples, bone marrow and such like that. How do we recognize when a patient is having a, a issue with their transplant? having organ rejection. What does that mean? It means their immune system is attacking the organ. It means it's that organ isn't going to function because it's being attacked. It's like it's a sudden disease process. So the symptoms of organ transplant rejection are the same as the initial failure of that organ. So a heart transplant patient will show heart failure during a rejection scenario. Same liver, kidney, um, whatever it happened to be. Here's a good point to remember. When a person has had a heart transplant, the um, vagus nerve that causes the heart rate to slow down will have been severed during the surgery process. So the patient will not have a um, parasympathetic or, um, yeah, they won't have a parasympathetic response anymore in the heart. So you won't need to give atropine to block the parasympathetic nervous system in the vagus nerve. If they're bradycardic, use a sympathomimetic like epi, but atropine will have little to no effect on their heart rate. Now you'd still use atropine if they were showing signs of cholinergic poisoning, uh, you know, sludgums or something like that. But for bradycardia, atropine won't have any effect if they've had a heart transplant. So infections, fever, shortness of breath, hypotension, um, these are all symptoms of rejection, you know, because it's an inflammatory response. So you're going to have that infection look, the look of infection, but you'll also have the low blood pressure, um, dysrhythmias, and things like that because the heart is no longer functioning appropriately. <sighs> Liver transplant, same thing. Very, your patient will become jaundiced. They will have um, one of the most common early signs that we'll see with these people is elevated ammonia and uh, levels. Now, obviously they're not doing ammonia levels in the field or at home. So what's it going to look like? Sudden onset of confusion, of delirium. Um, might They might appear like they have dementia or something, mood changes and such. Um, not familiar with, you know, not oriented to time and place. So significant confusion. This is, um, the family will often report it as the, he, they're acting the same way they were before they got the liver transplant. So the symptoms of rejection are the same as the initial organ failure. So kidneys, it'll look just like heart, 
renal failure, you know, the uremic frost, the decreased urine production, the altered mental status, the hyperkalemia, um, hypercalcemia, hypernatremia, all of these signs that we would have seen otherwise, including the infection. Yeah, lungs, I don't think I need to expound on that. You should figure out what a lung transplant would look like. Um, ah, there are pancreatic transplants. Like I said, I've never actually met somebody with it or seen it, but I knew it could happen. Um, I just couldn't remember if it was in here. So, not well tolerated. One of the things as a priority for this person is to return them to the facility that treated their organ failure in the first place. Where did they get the organ transplanted? That is where they need to go back because in a weird, complicated way, a person who receives an organ transplant does not possess that organ. That organ is somewhat still in the possession of the hospital and so that hospital, that facility is able to have a big say in what that patient does. Like they can say, well, we just paid to have an organ, uh, you know, we just did a liver transplant on you. In order to keep your end of the bargain, you, you've got to follow these rules. You can't eat, drink alcohol, you can't do these things or whatever, or take these medications. You have to come to us for help. That way we can preserve the life of that liver and give you the best possible uh, long-term outcome you could have. So, Our management of these patients is gonna be based on their symptoms that they are presenting with. We wanna treat those symptoms careful, or, um, supportively, airway, breathing, circulation, monitor for the infection. Uh, this could be very tricky if it's like a heart or a lung rejection, but um, so supplemental oxygen, uh, monitor cardiac output, keep the patient supine, things like that. If it is a cardiac or if they've had a heart transplant and are rejecting it, you will want to be really cautious that you're not overhydrating them or giving too much fluids, even though they may be hypotensive. This is the same as cardiogenic shock. This is heart failure. So fluids are only going to make that worse. So how do we educate our patients? How do we prevent them from having a... Um, a how do we prevent them from having that reaction and avoid that? Well, the big thing here is going to be avoid it, right? Get help as quick as possible. Have bracelets, identifiers, so that if somebody finds you unresponsive, they know that that's why you're likely exposed to that allergen. Um, keep your EpiPen with you. Biphasic reactions are they were doing fine, they were getting better, and then they had a relapse more or less and that was the histamine release was treated you got that taken care of but then the leukotriene release kicked in later this is why a patient um, even if they're doing better on scene if you were if it appeared to be an anaphylactic reaction you want to transport them and have them monitored for a while just to make certain that they don't have that leukotriene reaction that i was talking about before so Yeah. Um, these patients who have had an organ transplant should have information about the doctor and the facility that they need to go to. So um, educate them to have that available and ready in the event that they need it. Um, but the immunosuppressive medications and avoiding exposure to infectious disease is probably some of the most um, useful or helpful ways of um, handling an, uh, the uh, life after an organ transplant. So that pretty much wraps our immunology. Like I said, this was focused mostly on anaphylaxis. It was actually, it's actually not a very big chapter.